In the early to mid 5th century, a gospel movement took place in the country of Ireland. And this movement uh, was really impressive because it defied all expectations. Uh, It was a movement that took place in a country that was previously unreached, that the people looked at its inhabitants as barbarians. uh, And it took place not through the techniques that we would often think would lead to uh, such a revival in a country. And to be clear, there were tens of thousands of people in Ireland because of this movement that gave their life to Christ. And it didn't happen in the way that we would normally think. It didn't happen because this amazing, beautiful church building, massive, that was planted that just drew people in. It wasn't on the back of some talented speaker who could proclaim the gospel in in a beautiful way. It wasn't through the backing of finances. It simply took place because a community of believers left their home and planted themselves in Ireland. And they did so, this this small community, they planted themselves amongst uh, a lost people and they lived lives dedicated to living out the gospel, to living Christ-centered and living out the commands about loving one another that are found in the New Testament. And they had this mindset that was called belong before you believe. It was this idea that they would live in a community, they would love each other in such a way that the people outside them, uh, outside their community would take notice, that they were loving each other, uh, this agape love where they were being self-sacrificial, looking like Jesus, and the people, the the so-called barbarians around them would take notice, and they did. And they would say, hey, you know what? If you want to see more about this community, you can come and join in this community. You can belong despite the fact that you're not a follower of Christ. And as they came in, they would get the experience, the love and joy and support that was found only in a fully dedicated Christian community. And through this, tens of thousands of people gave their life to Christ. And, and if you're familiar with the idea of belong before you believe, it, it has some issues. If you take it to mean anything, it's not. I want to be clear. The emerging church that took place over the past 30 years, they took this to mean anybody could come into the church and take leadership. Uh, that wasn't what they were saying. They were simply saying, we're going to love each other and invite you to be and experience that love as well so that you can know what it means to follow Christ. And it worked. It worked in an amazing way. And today we're looking at 1 Peter. We're continuing our series. We're going to be looking at the first 11 verses of chapter 4. And in it, we are going to see the type of community that Peter and God calls Christ followers to live out and how that community shaped and changed uh, the people around them in northern Turkey. It changed the entirety of Rome. And so if you want to go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4, we'll dive right in. But I wanted to take a moment before we get going to just remind you that this is one, uh, this is a continual letter, right? He's, when it was a normally or originally presented, they would go around the country and it would be read to uh, followers of Christ uh, front to back. And we've now spent several months just kind of di- taking a deep dive into it. And I want to make sure we understand it because uh, that what we're talking about today immediately precedes what Jason spoke of last week. It's just one continual flow of thought. Where this is a new chapter and new verses, those chapters and verses didn't exist in the original text. Uh, They were put in afterwards by man to divide up as best they could uh, this book. But this is a continual flow of thought. So we have to remember, Jason spoke last week about the suffering of Christ, talked about baptism, but ultimately talked about how Jesus is victorious even though he died in the flesh And out of that, uh, he reigns and has ultimate authority over all things uh, in heaven and in earth. So keeping that in mind, let's go ahead. We're going to look at what Peter has for us in 1 Peter chapter 4. And the first thing we're going to see is this gospel divide that he's going to talk about. This gospel divide, that's the first one. And what I mean by that is that in our lives, there is a marker for us. There's the before, the past, and then the, uh, the present and the future on the other side that we live in. And the marker for us in our lives is when the gospel makes impact for us, when we give our lives to Christ. And he's going to talk about this divide, your past and your present. Uh, and it's interesting that... <clears throat> 
uh, Heather, our, our, our life groups director, she said, just like in our lives, there's a divide. There's the divide in history. There's the before Christ BC, and then there's AD Anno Domini in the year of the Lord. We measure all of history. Uh, we break it by where the gospel actually takes place. So uh, his, human history is, is looked at through the lens of the gospel, and our lives are looked at through the lens of the gospel. So let's see what he has to say. It says, verse 1, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So he's coming right out of that idea, talking about how Christ suffered and then it reigns from heaven. Uh, he says, Christ suffered in the, because Christ has suffered in the flesh. And what he means by this, the suffering that he's talking about is Christ's ultimate suffering. His death and sacrifice on the cross in his ultimate suffering where he dies literally in the flesh, we also have suffered along with him. But we don't die in the flesh like he does. We die to our flesh. We die from the fleshly desires. We die from our uh, enslavement to sin. There is this marker moment in our lives in which we are freed from sin because of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. We join in his suffering and we are transformed through it. And with that, he talks about arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Out of Christ's suffering, we see what led him to the cross and we are to arm ourselves in the same right thinking that he has. And so what is this right thinking? In 1 Peter, he talks about multiple different ways that while Christ was suffering, he did not sin. Uh, he never returned evil for evil, reviling for reviling. He, he, he was dedicated to living out the will of God in all things. And he, though he had the right to, he had the power to, he allowed judgment and justice to reside fully with the Father. And so we are to arm ourselves with the same thinking as we are called to live separate from sin. We are called to, as Peter has been calling through the entire book, called to live as a holy people uh, despite our circumstances and to act and live holy. We don't start with right acting. We start with right thinking. If we want to live as holy people, we have to think as holy people. And our greatest example is Christ who is willing to lay down his life to go to the cross for us. And we are participating, as it was said in chapter 2, we are in the midst of a spiritual battle. He uses this military words. We are to arm ourselves with that right thinking. We are to be intentional. We are to carry it with us as we are suffering from spiritual attack, from whatever suffering we get from the, the physical world. We are to carry that with us in all aspects of our lives so that we too can live as Christ lived. So we look to the living hope that he, he has given us, this grace, this unearned grace that grants us eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. We are to carry that forward. That is what the gospel has given us in this spiritual battle. And he goes on to say, as so, as to live for the rest of time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatries. He puts that gospel divide right there. In your past, you lived a life of sin, but now that you have been saved, you don't have to live in that anymore. You can live now and should live under the will and plan of God. There's this gospel divide in your life and it should look, make you look drastically different. It should shape you as you move along so that you no longer look like your past self. And I love the word he chooses there. He chooses this, this, this suffices. I kind of found it really weird. Why does he use this word, the past suffices for doing this sin? He uses three different types of sin. He, we can sum it up with sexual immorality, uh, drunkenness, and lawless idolatry. Uh, three things that were uh, running rampant at the time he was writing this and unfortunately seem to be uh, running just as rampant today in our culture. 
But he says that time was sufficient for that. That time was reasonable for you to live in that sin. And I thought that was kind of weird. Why would he say it's sufficient? Why was it reasonable for us to live in that sin? But it was because we were, of course, enslaved to that sin. There should be no other expectation that we had during that time. And he doesn't say it's sufficient or reasonable because it's good. It's simply because what else could we expect out of a person who knows, doesn't know the truth, who is mastered by sin? He said that time made sense that you were living in sin, but it doesn't make sense anymore. You are to leave this behind. You are free people. I think that's kind of what he's trying to get at. This idea that we, through the work of Christ, are no longer enslaved to sin and we are called to live that way. But just because we're freed from sin doesn't mean we know how to live as free people. In my followers' May group, we're reading this book, uh, The Pursuit of Holiness. In it, it kind of is going through the same thing we're going through in 1 Peter. This idea that we are called to live as holy people. Uh, we are to leave our old sin behind, but it's difficult. It's hard. And it's difficult because all of our life prior to the gospel, prior to Jesus transforming us through the work of the Holy Spirit in us, we were, we were enslaved to sin. And now we're supposed to just get up and leave it behind, even though we don't know anything else other than what we've lived for all our life. And he talks about this story that, that the, the slaves during Abraham Lincoln at the, the, after the Emancipation Proclamation, he freed all the slaves. He granted what so many people who had gone through this terrible, unjust thing desired most, which was freedom. And there's letters of these slaves granted the, the, the desires of the heart, this freedom that they've longed for. And they write and say, I don't know what to do with my life. I've been freed, but I don't even know what to do anymore. All I've known is being a slave since the moment I was born to the, this, this moment in my life. And there are instances where slaves would return to their masters. They couldn't be slaves legally, but they would live almost exactly the same as they had prior to that because they didn't know what it meant to live free. They had no idea how to even envision it or live it out. And so they returned to their old ways. And I look at it and it's so sad and frustrating and, and, and kind of bewildering, but it's true for us in our spiritual lives. We don't know how to live as free people. We have to learn how to live. And Peter's writing to these group of people, trying to uh, equip them, arm them with right thinking to say, you can live as free people, not free to do whatever you want, but free to be obedient to God. And he's giving, giving them the tools and the examples of how to do so. I have to say, I, I've, I've lived this out in my life. I remember, and I think I've shared this uh, years ago, this, this time in my life, it was high school, uh, kind of college age, and it was the, the age of MySpace. And if you're not familiar with MySpace, it was like Facebook, but weirder. It was like the Wild West of the internet. There was all the, you know, you had your page and you could put whatever music on it. But there was this, at this time, what the people loved to do was like these, these questionnaires, and you would go through and answer them all. And I got to the bottom one, is, are you a Christian? I'm like, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yes, put it there, post it up on my wall. And I got two immediate responses. It was from my sister, and one of my best friends, and they said, you're a Christian? It was a punch in the gut, but it was, a, it was eye-opening for me. Yes, I believed in Christ, but so much of my life looked like the life before I had given, chosen to follow him. I didn't know how to live free. I didn't know how to live different. I needed to learn it. I needed to leave behind how I acted and talked and the things I participated in so I could live out this holiness. It's found only when we begin to arm ourselves in the right thinking that Christ provides us. And he goes on though, and he's gonna give next, he's gonna give this gospel encouragement. You are, you are called to live holy in the face of suffering, but he has some good encouraging words for these people and encouraging words for us. It says, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. He says to them, hey, you are going, uh, you have changed your life. 
the people that you used to associate or the people who, who now uh, participate in the sin you used to participate, these Gentiles who, who don't live under the will of God or the law of God, they're going to look at you with suspicion and disdain. They look at you and see someone who is living in a way that doesn't match up to the lawlessness they live under, the debauchery they live under, and they are going to look down upon you. And he says, they'll be surprised, but you shouldn't be surprised. You should be prepared for this. Those who live in the dark can't understand the light. But out of that, he has, he has two encouragements. The first one is this, they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. You just have to think of them living at that time. There they are in the midst of northern Turkey. There are dispersed people who are being persecuted to the point of death. And as I read about it, I read all about Nero, how disgusting they treated these Christians, how they would treat them basically as animals. It it made me sad, but it, it made me angry. I wanted them not just to stop, not be hurt, but beyond that, I wanted justice for them. I I wanted them to fight back. I wanted God to fight back in their place. I wanted the evil that was being done to be brought to justice, for God to, I grew up in the Catholic church and all I ever heard was God like to to smite them, pour out your wrath on them. And I I can't speak for them, but I I have to imagine them living in the same situation. They're feeling the same thing. Like, God, where is justice in all of this? I chose to follow you and now I am going to die because they don't like us for it. And he points to this idea that, yes, what is happening to you is wrong, but you're not to seek judgment. You're not to deal out your own justice that you desire so greatly. You are to trust fully in God, the Father who has ultimate authority, who will judge the living and the dead. These people who are doing harm to you, they too will have to one day face their creator, And they will have to give account for the sins they've committed. And God, who is righteous and holy, where you are not (laughs) and not all powerful, he is all those things. And his judgment will be perfect and his justice will be perfect. The justice that I imagine they desire, the justice I desire, right? There's there's this part of it that that is given from God. He is God of justice. He has made us in his image and we have taken on a part of that. This desire for justice isn't wrong. What's wrong is when we take judgment and justice upon ourselves, we can't judge from a righteous position because we're not righteous. But God is and his judgment will be perfect. And so in the midst of their suffering or whatever suffering we're going through, that we can entrust God to be the dispenser of justice in his time and is his plan. That's the first encouragement he gives. The second one, he goes on, for this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead. That though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. And this is actually a passage that has quite a few different interpretations. It's not as confusing, I would think, as Jason's last week, but it is one that has a lot of speculation about what it could be, some interpretations that I think are reasonable and well thought out, and some that I think, unfortunately, are not in create because they create huge theological issues. And it's centered around this part right here. The gospel was preached even to those who are dead. And there are some interpretations that say that the dead he's talking about refers back to last week's passage, the, the, the spirits who are imprisoned. And, and it goes along with this idea that those spirits would have been human spirits and that <clears throat> the gospel, Jesus goes to preach the gospel to them and they get basically a second chance. It, it's one of these passages that has been used to reinforce this idea of purgatory, where, which is an extra biblical idea where people get uh, a second chance at life to, to come to Christ. And it doesn't, you can't find it in scripture. It's, it's, a, it's a misuse of this verse. What he, I believe he's trying to say, or is saying, excuse me, is he's talking about the people at that time who have recently died. The people who are being hunted down in Rome because of their belief in Christ. 
And he's saying to them, the gospel was preached to those people who just died. And they were judged in the flesh that they were put to death because the the people at the time judged them according to earthly standards and they judged them wrong. They looked at them as evil. They blamed them for uh, the fire in Rome. They looked at them as cannibals and incestuous and idol- or, or pagans. And they looked at them and so they put them to death. And they were judged wrongly by the flesh. But even though, even in the midst of that, they might live in the spirit the way God does, even though they have been wronged and has cost them their life, they have eternal life to look forward to. No matter what suffering you go to, no matter what persecution you experience, you, because of the gospel, you win. You have eternal life with your creator and savior. So whatever else you're going through, yes, it's real and it hurts, but in the grand scheme of things, it's infinitesimal. It's so small in, in the eternity that you have. And so he gives those two encouragements to these people suffering greatly that God will ultimately judge and hand out justice and that through him you have eternal life. That even though your life on earth at some point will come to an end, you have eternal life and to focus on that in the midst of your difficulties. And he's going to go on and he's going to talk about this idea of gospel living because of how you have, of everything that has happened, how you live is the change. He starts off and he says, the end of all things is at hand. And this, this, this part always, again, caused confusion for him. What is he talking about? The end of all things is at hand. Um, this book was written approximately 2,000 years ago. The end doesn't seem very much at hand. Like, I, I don't ever think 2,000 years is, a, is an at-hand type of timeline. And so to understand it fully, it's not this like this at-hand meaning at the door, the end time in which God will judge isn't just like right behind the door, but he's saying that it's on the horizon. It's coming. It's in view. Jesus has come, which means his second coming is now in sight. It is coming, and we are to live accordingly. Out of what he has done and what is to come, we are to live wholly out of his transformative power. And he gives several different ways in which they are to do so. He says, therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. He keeps coming back to this sober-minded idea. It's throughout all of First, or all of First Peter. He keeps saying to live sober-minded, to live in the, uh, with the mindset of Christ, not in this chaotic world and thinking that you used to live in, but in his ways in a ways of honor, in the ways of looking to Christ and live self-control. Don't respond out of anger into the things that have done, been done to you. And he goes on in verse eight, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. So the gospel living first and foremost means that you will be known for the love you have for each, each other. To be clear, he's writing to them about how they're to live out the gospel amongst themselves. This is how the church is to live with one another. And he says, more than anything else, you are to be guided by the principle of love. The principle of agape love, this self-sacrificial love that places everybody else above yourself. To live like Christ lived where he would sacrifice everything he has to care for each other. And this is, this right here is what they were known for. The Christians at the time in the face of persecution were known for their immense love for one another and the love for the people around them. And he says, doing this love covers a multitude of sins. If you love each other, you will deal with each other in a way that is different. You will be able to forgive each other. You will be able to move past all the difficulties that you experience in community. Love, love is your guiding principle. Against this, there is no law. He continues on, he says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. 
to show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Another thing that Christians at the time were known for during first century Christianity, this, is, this was it. They were known for their hospitality, that they would be so welcoming. Even when they didn't have much, they would give to allow people to come into their homes. Speakers, Peter and Paul, when they would come around to proclaim the gospel, they would open up their houses so that they would have a place to stay. They would give of their own food. They practice hospitality to one another so that the outside world would take notice. And this, this bled over into everything they did. They were hospitable to all. They were known for caring for the women, or, uh, whim, widows, women who had no standing in society because they lost their husband, who weren't heirs to their husband's fortune. They would bring them in and care for them as if they were their own family members. And they would provide for them when, when the culture would not. They were known for being hospitable to, to babies who were left out in fields to die. They would bring them in and treat them as their own kids because maybe dad didn't want them. They were known for being hospitable to orphans who would lose their parents. They would bring them in and treat them as if they were their own. They would do everything they could to care for the people around them. And Rome took notice. It says, as each of you received a gift, use it to serve one another that through the power of the Holy Spirit, each and every one of us belonging to the body of Christ, we are given a gift from God. But it's a gift that isn't to build us up individually. It is for the body of Christ. It's to support one another. It's, it's to show our love of God through the works that he has equipped us to do so that we can care for one another, that we can love one another. It says, whoever speaks is one who speaks words of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. That there's, different, there's, so, there's a multitude of gifts, but he, he highlights to this idea of speaking, right? That there are teachers in the church, there are speakers in the church as one of the gifts that God has given us. And if that's your gift, great. Use it though not to glorify yourself, but to equip and encourage the people of God for uh, whatever situation they're in and for everyone else who has been giving gifts that allow us to serve in different ways. Use those to serve one another, but through it all, it's by the strength that God supplies. That these gifts, they're not of your own doing, but they're the gift of God for his body. And he, he kind of ties it all up and says, in order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. That all of this gospel living isn't simply so that we can have better lives, although that is a byproduct of it, but it is so that God in all of this is glorified through Jesus Christ. And this is what they did. This is how they lived and they were known for it. And it changed that everyone around them, people continued to come to Christ and it defied again expectations. This was a community that was suffering from persecution from the outside, but chose to live holy as Peter and God had called them. And, and it worked. Despite whatever we may think or expect, it worked. They, they won against Rome. They defied expectations. Like it makes no sense. Rome should have crushed them. But they survived. They outlived Rome. Rome fell and Christianity continued to take off. And it's because they lived out that idea of being a part of a loving Christian community that lived out the gospel in all aspects of their life. And the people around the people who often hated them, they continued to take notice. And they were brought into that community. They, although that's not necessarily the idea that they were living out like in fifth century Ireland, they lived that idea, belong before you believe. They said, as people took notice, they brought them into the community. They showed them what a loving Christian community was and it made the church explode. Thousands and thousands of people came to Christ because they lived this way. And this is how the church was designed to look. This is what church was supposed to be. It was supposed to be a people living fully in the gospel that couldn't help but be noticed by the outside world. And I've heard so many times this, 
this, this, this frustration, this disappointment that the church is shrinking, that in, in the statistics back this up, the church is shrinking, that we're losing people, but not only that, but the newer generation, they're just not interested in the church. And I think a lot of the reason is because the church isn't known for this anymore. Gospel living isn't our defining characteristic. Love isn't our de- the, the thing we, we put forward out into the world most or even to each other. The new generations, they look at us and in the research, there's plenty of research that backs this up that they don't have a problem with Jesus or the ideas taught in the Bible. What they have a problem with is the church. They see the things that we're supposed to do like this and they see a church that, that, that fights the outside world, that wages sometimes a culture war or a political war and they say that doesn't really match up. We're, we need to continue and return to living like this. This is what brings people to the gospel, not fighting them. It's what Peter was telling them, what God was telling them is what he's telling us now. If we want people to come to the church, if we want people to come to Christ, it's not through fighting them, but loving them. And he ends this passage, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Thank you guys so much. Uh, I love you guys. And I'll return you guys to campus pastors. Thanks. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, Our transformational moment today is this question. Do people feel like they can belong with you before they believe? That is, are you living in a way that exemplifies the love of Christ and, and brings people in and allows people into whatever community you have so that they can live in that same love, that they can experience the gospel, even though they may not believe fully yet or just be wrestling with it? Um, do people feel that way? Can they join in whatever you're doing uh, so that they can learn more and see how the gospel has impacted you. So ultimately, hopefully, uh, they too can believe and experience the transformational grace and work of Christ. Uh, today is uh, our communion day. Uh, and so if you have your bread and your juice, if you'll join me today, I wanted just to read from Matthew 26, uh, starting in verse 20, 26. It tells the the account of the Last Supper in which communion was instituted. He says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body. So if you grab your bread and with me, go ahead and eat. Continue on on in verse 27. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So if you take your juice and drink it with me. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. I hope you have an amazing week. Love you.